Nog needs to get down to the storeroom and get five kegs of Tacarian mead. Jake is the winner of this year's Batar Prize for his collected series. And we're treated to one of the best episodes in the history of Star Trek. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Yeah, hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Miss Melissa Longo. Hello, 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 hello. Six hellos from oh, her. Oh, hello. <laughs> seven. <laughs> I was going for uh, seven. It is a, no- oh, I get it, because the laughy face. Yeah. It is a <laughs> Nog episode, which is our favorite episodes. Um and uh, Melissa was referencing that uh, Aaron Eisenberg, when he used to do emoji reactions of the laughy, cryy face, he would usually do or always do seven of them in a row. Laugh, 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 laugh. <laughs> anyway, um, we are reviewing yeah. Deep Space Nine, season four, episode three, The Visitor. And for my money, one of the best episodes in the history of Star Trek. And I was reminded of that as I watched the episode again. How are you guys doing today? Man, oh, right. doing great. This, this is- Hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have a box of Kleenex when you watch this episode. <laughs> Allergies? Every Allergies. time. Yeah. Every uh, time. This, this, this is a tough one to watch for me, but it was, it was really, mm. it was really good, but really sad. Mm-hmm. and. I mean, such a great story. I mean, this story is so amazing. Uh, Ryan, who directed this episode? Oh, sorry. Yes, this was directed by David Livingston. Again, I I thought the same thing. I was like, who directed, who wrote this? Written by Michael Taylor, who hadn't written many episodes, just a few, but one of which uh, he wrote the script for In the Pale Moonlight which is another one of the best Deep Space Nine episodes. Mm. Uh, He also went on to write uh, a dozen or more, I think maybe 17 episodes of Voyager as Mm. well. So Mm -hmm. he's done pretty well for himself. But uh, this one in the the Pale Moonlight are have to be his best, yeah. So good. Yeah. This is such a beautiful story. And I've seen it many times. And it doesn't matter how many times I see it. <laughs> I, I watched it last week and then I watched it last night and it doesn't matter. I cry every single time. It's just, the story is so touching and so beautiful. It's just, it, it gets me right here. Speaking of crying, before we get too deeply into this, everybody do us a favor, make sure that you subscribe to this channel. Please uh, hit subscribe hit the bell icon for notifications. If you do have a moment, please go over to patreon.com slash the seventh rule and say hi to us. Consider joining the team. Uh, if you'd like to donate or become a part of this show, please do so. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And back to the lesson at hand. Perfection is perfect. So I'm going to let him understand. Uh-huh. Right. Melissa, next line. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that song. She's like, don't ask me. <laughs> I don't uh, think I know that song at all. 1993, yeah, no. maybe. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, please go on, go on, Sorak. Um, Tony Todd. Tony Todd, Tony Todd, Tony Todd. Um, I mean, he deserves his credit for this one because he, he really knocks this one out the park. Um. I really enjoyed seeing him play the, uh, the scene that he did with uh, with Nog when they were at the at his house in uh, in Louisiana there, and I, I thought that was like a great moment. I, obviously, I wasn't there for that yes. scene, so yeah. um, watching it is really fun to see. It's actually interesting to see people playing opposite a uh, version of me that's not me. So. <laughs> So it's kind of interesting when I look at it. Uh, for example, Cisco and and Tony Todd as Jake um, doing the scenes, and I and I made actually was thinking, what are they thinking as they're doing the scene, trying to pretend they're doing it with me, right? So that was another thought that went through my head. But I remember getting this script when it first came out. And um, you know, you read the scripts to prepare for the next episode shoot, and I, 
you know, tears were dropping onto the mm-hmm. page as I was reading the script. I think this is the first script that made me cry just by reading it. And wow. Um, and each time, yeah, yeah. And each time I watch it, it's almost it brings back those same emotions almost all over again. So the first time you're reading the script, do you remember when when you first started to get emotional? Like, was it was it from the very beginning? Was it the end that hit you? Was it kind of throughout? Um, yeah, it was throughout. It was it was the fact that you know the the love of the father son, how much they you know how much how much they love each other and also the, the the torment of of Jake's perspective seeing his dad come in and out ever so often but I felt the opposite torment too from Cisco's perspective kind of seeing his son get old in front of him I think there was a line where he says you're older than me <laughs> right and and it was like that was another torment like you know I wanted to just see you have kids and do this and mm-hmm. and you didn't do all this with your life and it felt like Oh man, so you, you get hurt from both sides, you know, uh, as a, as a child, and then a, and now for me as a parent, um, looking at it from both sides is is, is really painful. Go ahead, Melissa. You look like you're going to say something. Oh no, I was just um, thinking that yeah, you do get hurt from both sides. The Jake right. is mourning the loss of his father over and over and over again. It's not once, but multiple times that he loses his um, father. And then you get it from Cisco, um, Captain Zisco's side where he sees his son is hurting and there's nothing he can do about it. You know, he can't help him. And the only way he can try to maybe help him is tell him to move on and live life. Poke your head up once in a while. Yeah. yeah, you know, I really felt it from the perspective of Captain Sisko uh, upon this viewing um, where he's watching his son throw his life away. And that, you know, as, as a parent, no, but no parent wants to see that. I mean, he's thinking like, kid, you know, go live your life. Forget like, what do you do? Like, like that's got to be a terrible feeling for a parent to watch their kid throwing their life away. And every time he checks in, that life's getting worse. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, I want grandkids. I want you to be successful. I want you to be happy. I don't want you, you know, crapping on your own life. And, and poor Jake is not just feeling the loss of his father, but the realization and the guilt that he has when he realizes that, He's the reason. Obviously, it's not his fault at all, and there's nothing he did wrong. But a child can't, wouldn't help but carry that guilt with them about if they're the reason their parent is, you know, dead or disappearing or going through whatever it is. He's carrying this guilt around, feeling like it's his fault. But I will tell you the line that that got me. That I was like, wow, that is that's quite a line. Um, was uh, where was it? It was towards the end uh, when uh, it was at the end when, when Captain Sisko is telling Jake, you know, don't, you know, don't do this for me. And, and, and Jake says for you and for the boy that I was. Mm. And that, you know, because he's, he's remembering that 18 year old kid and the agony that he just went through. And he's like, dude, I'm doing this for that kid. And I think we all kind of get that when we look back at ourselves as kids, we, we almost, it's almost like a, a, another life away, you know, he's like, and, and he's remembering that moment and he's like, nobody should go through that. And that poor kid did. I'm trying to fix that. It's just a beautifully written script. Mm-hmm. And it kind of re- actually reminds me of the emissary when, mm-hmm. when, Benjamin has lost his wife and he's dealing with that loss, but he's an adult and he has um, different skills to help cope with that loss. And he has the prophets too, to help him realize why do you exist here? Why do you continue to exist here in the pain of the loss? But Jake doesn't have anybody to help him 
in that way. So Jake is existing it at his 18 year old self, the, the loss and that pain is still there and he's still in that adolescent, um, you know, right. place of loss. Mm -hmm. So he exists there and he didn't, didn't move on from there. Although at one point he almost did, but. Yeah. And the other thing that I, <clears throat> thought was amazing were the people that stood up to the plate and um, looked after Jake when he was mm. going through that. <laughs> um, they showed a scene with Quark telling Nog, you know, yes. uh, what, why don't you guys go to the house? You never mind those five that pieces. Was, you know? Yeah. And, and he's like, and hurry up before I change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was good because that, that means Quark has a heart and he's, yeah. and, and, and he wants he he wants Jake to feel better and have fun. So he's like, you know what? Never mind the work. I'm gonna let you guys do that. The other person that stepped up was Dax. They said mm -hmm. Dax looked after Jake, and um, I, you know I felt that. But I also felt Nog being a good mm -hmm. friend, trying to cheer his buddy up, like, hey man, let's do this, let's do that. And he's like, yeah, I feel like it's early. I want to go to bed. You know, it's late, and and being sad, but. I just felt like Nog was such a good friend in that moment. He was like, I got to do something to cheer my, my, my buddy up. So those things actually were making me really uh, emotional because I was thinking, wow, that's, that's what a extended family does for each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're there for each other. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was pretty. Kira you know, also not, had her moment as well, where she yeah. was, right. she was, maybe a little less of a friend and, and maybe a little bit more of a guardian where she seemed to take on the responsibility of watching over Jake and saying, okay, you can stay here. But when, you know, when trouble comes, you better get your ass on that shuttlecraft punk. <laughs> I want to kick <laughs> yeah. your butt right onto that yeah. shuttlecraft. Yeah. 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 And that, that was her own mother, motherly instincts that were yeah. kicking in. Um, so you get to see how like the, the whole DS9 kind of community is, is, is cheering Jake up. And um, I like the tribute that they had on the promenade where they had, a, you know, the whole promenade was full of people and, and they were giving their tributes to Cisco. Um, it was a nice special moment for that. But yeah, this was, this was one of those things where it's like every single moment. Uh, I think my mom was watching me as I was wa watching this episode. Oh, yeah. And she's, she's seeing me like grab tissue after tissue. She's like, what? You know, what are you watching? You know, what are you watching? You're like, I'm uh, watching me. Uh, it's, it's funny because I was like, yeah, I'm watching Deep Space Nine. And she said, Deep Space Nine? Making you cry like that? I was like, yeah. This, is, this, is too this episode is oh too gosh. much. Yeah. You um take us back all the way to 1995. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any memories of of shooting that? You know, I you know, tell us about like uh, Tony Todd. You said Tony Todd kind of you know watched you and maybe asked questions. Uh, how did because I did notice that Tony Tony had a couple of those uh, mannerisms, a couple of Jake mannerisms that we could talk yes. about a little later. But you want to yeah. tell us a little bit about about that? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> Tony Todd, when, when he was brought in to, to play Jake, came and introduced himself to me. Uh, obviously, I knew him from Candyman at that time because Candyman was fresh on everybody's mind. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I was like, Candyman is playing me? You know, so <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a special moment. But he, he, he did take time to follow me around and – you know, he was just he's like, I just want to hang out and and um, see how you go, and I'll just be over here, it's just minding my own business. But I feel like he really did play the older version of Jake in, in an exceptional way, and um, he did extreme justice to this particular episode. Um, back in '95, I can remember that the this would be a Jake heavy episode, and and it would was probably the first Jake centric episode. Right. Yeah. Um, so I remember reading saying, well, I'm like my name is on every page as I turn the script. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no relaxation time for this one. Um, 
So that that was the first thing that I thought about was the challenge that was coming ahead uh, doing the episode. Like this is going to be challenging. This is a lot of this is a lot of work. Um, but then they ended up breaking that work up, breaking it down, you know, into my parts where I was featured, and then obviously Tony Todd took up the bulk of the uh, the responsibility. So um, that made it a that was a big stress reliever for me. I was like, whoa, I don't have to do so much, and uh, I'm, I was happy that that Tony Todd would would do it. The other thing I remember is that they wanted me to play the older version of Jake, and so I went through a process of makeup. And they put the prosthetics and aged me as best they could. And they decided that um, I didn't look old enough and I couldn't pull off old Jake. That's when yeah. they decided to cast Tony Todd. Yeah, it did seem like you were still two years away from being able to put makeup on and be and act like an old person. You know, you still had that young man body and young man manner, mannerisms. It's almost impossible for an 18 year old no matter how much makeup you put on them to pull off an old person you know once you're 20 sure maybe you could do it but yeah uh do you, you remember what that process was like was it was it like pretty quickly or did it take a while for them to come to it come to that decision uh i just remember being in the makeup chair because i was hardly ever in the makeup chair more than five minutes so this was a, this was like all right Sit down. We're gonna put a whole, you know, prosthetics on you and, and age your face. And there's all types of uh, techniques that they use to do it. Uh, one in particular was this this kind of liquid that, when applied to your skin, basically wrinkles your skin. And so they used a little bit of that and they blended in the rest. But I then went from that makeup procedure to the other side of the lot. To where Rick Berman and the big boys were, and I walked in the door like, yeah, no, no, that's not gonna work. So it was, kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it, was kind of, it was kind of quick, you know. Um, and like I said, I, I'm actually glad that that worked out that way because right. it, it gave a chance for Tony Todd <clears throat> to do real legitimate justice to this role, and 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 just what a great story. And, and you know, one of the things I really like about this story is how it opens. The episode opens mm. at the end, essentially. And he's kind of narrating and doing the storytelling about it. And I like that. I like that they started from the end and moved backwards. Um, just a little bit a little bit different. And this is one of those episodes. I mean, it could have been a Twilight Zone episode. It could have been, you know, Alfred Hitch. This is, this is across the board what sci-fi is about. Exactly. I thought the same thing, that this is yeah. a script that could be put anywhere because it's just a good story. It's a good story through and through. And Deep Space Nine is just where the story was housed. It could be reskinned as a Battlestar Galactica mm -hmm. episode or, like you said, a Twilight Zone or Black Mirror. It could be any of those things. Yeah, so that's yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, I, I may notice that too. I was like, oh, I love this opening and the way they're setting this tone of the episode. It was great. The rain falling and yeah. you're at a house and, and you pass the picture of Jake and his father and, and, and nothing is, you know, hitting you over the head. It's all these little subtle details that are filling in the story as, as you watch it. And it's so nice and lovely. I love the way the op it, it opened. Right. And, you know, speaking of the opening, what, uh, the funny thing is in that first minute, I was just taking notes. I like to kind of take notes on the, the opening scene because Deep Space Nine is always really interesting in how they open up a, an episode, you know, with whatever they're doing in the slice of life, slice of life but this was a little different. And so I take the notes and when I was done taking the notes, I, look, I realized, I was like, this almost looks just like what the script would have said. Because <laughs> it just says, <laughs> you know, oh, it says, uh, rainy day, picture of Jake and Cisco. A hand holds a baseball, pulls out a hyperspray to his neck, visitor at the door, she's hurt. And I was like, well, that's kind of like, <laughs> that's almost like if you read that in the script, you'd be like, ooh, I'm listening. This sounds interesting. And that's how we yeah. were as a viewer you see that opening 30 seconds and you get sucked in right away. And it's kind of like 
gather around everybody. We're about to have Deep Space Nine story time hour. You know, that's yes. what it felt like. Yes. Wonderful story time hour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I wrote down teardrop Tony because uh, Tony taught in that opening <laughs> scene. He was dropping tears. He, he was dropping those tears, and uh, he said, "He said you came here on on, on this day of all days." Mm-hmm. And right. she's like, "Well, what?" She's like, "What happened today is like the worst thing that could happen to a kid." You know, my father died. Exactly, and, and that's when his. Uh, Tear, tears start rolling off his face. I said, wow, teardrop Tony. He's, he's, he's opening the game with a home run hit. I thought you were going to say you're describing his free throw shooting, but whatever. Home, <laughs> home run is fine too. You know? Tear. But yeah, it's, you know, and then you get Cisco saying it's life, Jake. You can't miss it. You oh, know, if you don't, I love you, that quote. You, you, you can miss it if you don't open your eyes. Yeah. I thought that was. That almost sounds like a Ferris Bueller line. What was the line that he says? You know, if you don't get out and, you know, enjoy it every once in a while or something. I think he was yeah, in the shower when he said it. Oh, yeah, this, I, I wrote it down. Yeah, you want to poke your head up every once in a while and take a look around, see what's going on. Oh, it's that's life, what, Jake. You can miss it if you don't open your eyes. Yeah, well, the line that Jake said to Melanie is the same uh, line that right. his father says, said to him. Exactly. He says, while you're studying my stories, poke your head up once in a while. See what's going on. It's life, Melanie. And that, yeah, it's a beautiful little it's uh, so return great. of favor. By the way, a uh, couple things to look forward to. We're about to take our break. Uh, we have a, a very important actress that played Melanie. So that's something we'll talk about right on the other side. Uh, also, there was another line I really wanted to cover. That was another one of my favorites. Uh, we'll talk about that on the other side as well. Uh, lots to lots to hang on to there. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take our quick break, and we'll be right back on the seventh rule. <laughs> 